we are incredibly excited to be welcoming Mr. Teke. Um, he has been the chair of council that and has been helping us through COVID-19, providing us with a lot of his insight and wisdom. The book that he has chosen is um, Bakari Seles, My Vanishing Country. We encourage everybody to please put their questions in the Zoom chat group. And once Mr. Teke has finished his presentation, I will um, pose the questions to him. And so we will have a debate and conversation. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Prof. Mawala, our VC, and he will introduce Mr. Teke to us, and then it will be over to Mr. Teke to give his insights into this very interesting book. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Maria, and also thank you very much to uh, our, our Chair of Council, uh, uh, Mr. Michael Solomon Teke. Uh, <laughs> I, I had to say it as it is written in the, in the ID book. Sure. Uh, Mr. Teke is the founder of Richards Bay Coal Terminal. And he is a prominent businessman who has operated in a diverse areas of interest in the mining sector, in the financial services sector, and also in the information technology sector. He received his uh, first undergraduate degree at the University of Limpopo. At that time, it was called the University of the North. And uh, he received his other undergraduate qualification from the University of Johannesburg. And at that time, it was the Ramsey African State University. As well as a Master's of Business uh, Administration at the University of South Africa. He has been the president of the Chamber of Mines uh, of South Africa and uh, has been a director of uh, Optimum Co. Uh, if I were to start speaking about uh, uh, Mr. Teke, uh, I would be uh, here for the whole hour and you would not have the opportunity to engage him on the book uh, he has chaired many, uh, many bodies, but I am just going to talk about his most important chairmanship as far as we, as the University of Johannesburg, are concerned, which is the University of Johannesburg Council. And ever since he has been uh, a chair of council, the University of Johannesburg has overtaken uh, the University of Pretoria and University of uh, KwaZulu Natal uh, uh, and Stellenbosch in the QS rankings. Without any further ado, I am going to hand over Mr. Teke to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Marwala, and thanks to the entire team and those who are listening. Firstly, thank you for the opportunity for me to talk to you about this book. Uh, the book, My Vanishing Country, a memoir by Bakuri Sellers. I like reading books, but I'm not one of those cleverest people. Right now I'm reading a book called Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom. Bloody difficult book to read. When I was reading a book by General Jim Mattis, he's called the Mad Dog in the US Army. You know, he was the Secretary of Defense and resigned uh, during uh, President Trump's time, and uh, his book called Sign Chaos. After reading the book, I was looking at Audible, and I had to choose a book that I had to read. And this book came up, My Vanishing Country, by Carrie Sellers. In 2015, I was watching CNN, and there was, there was a funeral of the late Clementa Clem Pinkley, who was a pastor at Mother Emmanuel, a church in Charleston in the U.S., where a 21-year-old gentleman by the name of Dylan Roof, I shouldn't call him a dead gentleman, obviously, he came in and he prayed with the group at the church that evening at Charleston, and then he shot several people, including Pastor Clementa Pinkley. And uh, what attracted me to that conversation or to that interview at the time, President Barack Obama gave a eulogy, and at the end, or towards the end, he started singing Amazing Grace. I'm sure you remember that. 
And after that, they interviewed three people, Van Jones, Bakari Sellers, and Jesse Jackson. And at that time, I then said to myself, who is this young man? He appears all the time on CNN. Then later, I started seeing him being a commentator on CNN during elections. And suddenly, this book showed up. The sin that you hear a lot about, it's about a place called Denmark. And immediately when I read this book, I saw Denmark. I thought these towns were named probably after the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, which is not true. And uh, if you read the first part of this book where he talks about Denmark, he talks about most of the businesses that were open in Denmark in my father's day are now shattered. That's Bakari Selas is describing Denmark. A landromat, a landromat is still open as well as Pools 5 and Dime, a few restaurants and a hardware store, but that's nearly it. The entire area no longer has a hospital, whether it's Denmark or somewhere else in Alabama or Mississippi. If you had driven through 40 years ago, it would have been pul pulsing with energy and black life. The train tracks traveled north, south, east, and west, heading to Chicago, Atlanta, New York City, and Los Angeles. At one time, Denmark had a pickle factory, a Coca-Cola bottling plant, and a furniture manufacturing company. The town was packed with people of all trades, bricklayers, technicians, construction workers, bakers, painters, and cooks as well as black businesses of every kind, which is why you had some wealth in a place that's 85% black. But today that town, so I juxtaposed Denmark and related to where I grew up in Springs, because when I grew up in the town called Springs, there were lots of these businesses. And today you look, that, you look at the town and all those businesses are gone. Bakari Sellers, was born into a family. His father is Dr. Cleveland Sellers. His, his mother is Gwendolyn Sellers. She came from Memphis. And I chose this book, let me be clear upfront. It had nothing to do with Black Lives Matter or what the recent developments in the United States of America or globally in relation to race. But I'll link it to that later as we have a conversation. Bakari Sellers is the youngest of the three kids. The eldest in this family is a daughter by the name of Nosi Izwe, Abidemi, Sellers. It's an, those are interesting names. Nosi Izwe, because being South African, you get attracted to the name and you say, how did she get this name, this young lady? Well, you'll discover that Nosi Izwe's godmother was Miriam Makeba. Miriam Makeba was married to Stokely Carmichael. And you know who Stokely Carmichael is. Stokely Carmichael and, Mr. and Dr. Cleveland Sellers were comrades as civil rights activists in the US during that time. No was born in 1974 when her father was in prison. And hence they call her Abidemi, the one born when father was away. She's a medical doctor now. The second in the family, it's a son by the name of Lumumba, Cleveland Sellers. I'm sure none of you is going to ask me a question about Lumumba because you know Patrice Lumumba and the like. And the last born, who was born in 1984, it's a young man, Bakari Sellers. I was attracted to this man's CV. I was attracted to his activities. I've explained earlier that I saw him in those interviews. I've listened to him as a commentator in the political sphere in the US. But there are great things that he has done. And if you read this book, you will be attracted to three important things. And let me start by saying, let's talk first about the father. Dr. Trivland Sellers is, has had several defining mom, moments in his life. But there are two important things that I want to touch on. Number one, if in your life you've read a story about Emmett Till, the story of a young man who came from Chicago, visited South Carolina, and was killed brutally in the hands of those who killed him. I'm loath not to use the words white, but those who killed him, they killed him because he was whistling at a white woman in a store. 
And that defined effectively the life of Dr. King and Sellers, who started to fight for the civil rights of the Black or African Americans. The second defining moment for Dr. Cleveland Sellers is the Orange Bank massacre, which happened when three students were killed by the police or what they used to call, they still call them state troopers in the US. And when that happened, Samuel Hammond Jr., Delano Middleton and Henry Smith were killed. And that has been part of Dr. Cleveland Sellers' life throughout. He has lived through this agony. He has lived through this pain. He has lived with this throughout his life as a civil rights activist. He went to prison. He came back. The FBI, the politics of the country, everything has followed him because he was tainted in a way by this Orange massacre, Orangeback massacre in South Carolina. So that's Dr. Cleveland Sellers for you. If you look at Nosizwe, Nosizwe, the daughter, focused on her education, bright, became a medical doctor. She's practicing at the moment. Lumumba Cleveland Sellers, who is Cleveland Lumumba Sellers III, because the grandfather, he's the third generation, is a steady person in the family. He's a minister and uh, he's a tech executive as they describe him. The young man shows up, born in 1984. Bakari starts school and uh, he focuses on his education. He's a studious young man. The interesting thing about people who describe people when they are young, they like to talk about, for instance, in Bakari's case, you will read in the book where they mention that he's a, young, he's, a, he's, a, he's a boy in an old man's body or something like that, simply because he was bright. He used to ask people questions. What fascinates me about this book with Bakari is that his father focused on him, probably as a torchbearer, as the guy who takes over from him. Maybe Lumumba was not interested. Maybe you know, Sizo was not interested. But when there were celebrations, when they celebrate, not celebrations as such, memorials where they remember the Orange Bank massacre, his father, Dr. Cleveland Sellers, will always take him with. He would take him from school, he'll go to school and fetch him to go to this memorial service if it, when it happens every time. And that's how Bakari Salas then grows up to become the son of the civil rights movement. We grew up in South Africa, ladies and gents. You know very well that with our history, a lot of people talk about what are your struggle credentials? We often ask people those things in South Africa. We say, were you involved in the struggle? And probably it does pave the way for you to do certain things. I have read this book and noticed that Bakari was the son of the civil rights movement. Bakari used to take phone calls as a kid from Uncle Jesse, which is Jesse Jackson, Uncle Stokely Carmichael, Uncle uh, Julian Bond, Uncle uh, uh, John Lewis, all those civil rights icons, he has rubbed shoulders with them and that has built his character. Now, let's talk about three things that attracted me then to this personality. One, he arrives at Morehouse College in Atlanta which is a great college. When my son was young, I used to read about Morehouse College. I was attracted to it because Martin Luther King went there. And I'm sure you know that uh, 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 one of the top actors, Samuel L. Jackson, was at that college. In fact, he was at the funeral of uh, Martin Luther King as a youngster when he was still at, and, and he went through to Morehouse College in Atlanta. So my attraction to this institution is very, I still, I still like the institution, though I'm old now, I won't be able to go back to school. Bakari arrives there, he challenges to become a president, an SGA president, and he succeeds. In the first instance, when he challenges to become the president, his resu the results of the elections are questioned, and when they get questioned, these results, he goes back and he persists and he wins. Ultimately, he says, 
there are no permanent friends, there are no permanent enemies, but there are permanent interests. That's the strength of the character that you're talking about. The second one is he goes back to South Carolina to challenge for the a U.S. state representative in South Carolina to challenge an 82-year-old Democratic, uh, uh, Democratic Party elected member, John Rhodes. And he challenges him for his position, this 82-year-old who has held on to this position, and he beats him and he becomes the youngest U.S. state representative or legislator at the age of 21. That is serious for me to look at a young man who says, I want to challenge for these things. I want to do, do these things. I know very well that if he grew up during our time in South Africa and these things happened, probabilities of that we would be questioning and saying, yeah, well, he grew up in the civil rights movement and he's got good struggle credentials or something like that. But that doesn't take away the fact that you're dealing with a formidable young man here. The third one, he then decides to uh, walk away from his position to challenge for a lieutenant governor of, the, of South Carolina to challenge a very strong uh, candidate by the name of Henry McMaster. And we know very well that he lost in those elections. He didn't succeed to become lieutenant governor. When I read the U.S. history and I read the politics of the U.S., I'm attracted to that. I like to read about that. There's a young man who's growing up in the U.S., I think he's in Wisconsin. His name is Mandela. Uh, uh, I'll remember his name. This young man is a lieutenant governor of Wisconsin now. But if you look at the history of the United States, you see this young generation, this young generation that is coming up and becoming strong, and they are going to challenge for bigger positions. Hence, I believe that if you look at Bakari Sellers, he's going to be the next uh, Barack Obama. I think he's the next US president, probably after John, uh, Joe Biden or after Donald Trump, a uh, second term. I don't know. Probably he will stand up and challenge for the elections. He's still young. He's 35 years old. Let me talk about an interesting thing about men in this book. You know, we are, most of us as men, we have a tendency of not talking about certain things because we think if we talk about them, they make us weak. He talks, and uh, his mother talks about it to say, Bakari and his father, they cry easily. They are criers. When something happens, they cry. We've seen him on TV crying. In fact, the most recent was two weeks ago or three weeks ago with the George Floyd situation when he cried on TV. Men like to say, we don't cry, tigers don't cry, men don't do that, we don't show your weakness. And I'm fascinated by the fact that they talk about it as one of those things that is common between the father and son. But don't underestimate that and think that they are weak, they are very strong, they are not softies. The second one, he's open and talking about his anxiety. And I like it, if you read on chapter eight, he talks about anxiety as the black man's superpower. And let's not be racial about this, guys. Anxiety, I mean, affects a lot of human beings, but he's open about it. He talks about it and he says, These are the th this is something that has affected me in my life. And there was a time at, when he was asked to make speeches and he sort of struggled when he was standing in front of people simply because of this anxiety. And I like that type of spirit in a male, whereby you believe that there are things that we talk about and we say as men, we shouldn't be talking about these issues simply because it, look, it makes you look weak. Don't tell people that you have an illness. I am wondering, in fact, right now when we have COVID-19 and we're talking about comorbidities, that uh, how many men are hiding their comorbidities because we should open up and talk about them so that if something happens, then we can be assisted. But in this case, we have this young man who talks about the, he cries. Two, he doesn't hide that he has suffered from anxiety and he turns it around and he talks about it as a black man's superpower. Now, let's talk about an interesting event here. I'd like to talk about him at a personal level, meeting his wife, Ellen, Dr. Ellen Rucker, 
his wife is eight years older than him, doesn't matter. Age doesn't mean anything. But he then talks about the birth of his children. God blesses Bakari with twins, a daughter and a son. And this daughter is named Sadie. Sadie is named after, Baka, uh, about, uh, after Ellen Rucker's aunt. And uh, Stokely, you know who Stokely is. We've spoken about Stokely Carmichael. And uh, he names his son Stokely. He then reflects and talks about when he was in hospital and he was, uh, after the birth of the children, when he noticed that his wife was facing serious challenges, she could have died as a result of giving birth to the two children. There were complications. But Bakari was there for his wife, and that's something that I've always touted with young men. I always talk about it when young men grow up and say, guys, when you grow up, you get married and your wife gives birth at a hospital. Don't go away with your friends to celebrate. Be there for your children. It makes a lot of history. I see it with my son, Buigany and Tiamo, because I was there for them when they were born. And I reflected on this, that this young man made sure that his life is within the limits of what a mortal man should be. But doesn't make him a saint. I'm sure you have read the book and uh, you've picked up when he was at Morehouse as a student, he made mistakes. He was caught drinking. He was out on late nights. At some stage, he faced a cafe. Uh, he, he trespassed and went to the ladies' uh, college. He made mistakes in his life. It doesn't make him a saint, but he is a man on a path that will make him a different young man into the future. What then makes this book so special to me? We're living in interesting times, ladies and gentlemen. We're living in interesting times in the USA. 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 25 years ago, I look at the United States of America when I ask a lot of people, when you leave South Africa or when you leave your country, where would you go? Where would you go and live? And a lot of people say, I'm going to live in the US because it's a developed country. It's a developed economy. It's the best country in the world. I listened to uh, Gwendolyn Sellers, Bakari Sellers' mother, describing Denmark, that Denmark is so backward. And if you look at it as a town, it looked like a developing country. So you then reflect and say, Wow, in the US, do they have places like that? Because a lot of people think this is the world, this is the first world, America. The second part is, I have always read about Jim Crow. I'm sure you all read about this. The legislation in the US that relates to separation of blacks and whites. Until today, you still come across, across racism, raw, raw, raw in the US. And you sit back and you say, this is a country where I have read and been told about Emmett Till, a young man who was killed for whistling at a white woman, two, the, the, the Orangeburg massacre, three, the, the, the assassination of uh, uh, Martin Luther King, the assassination of Malcolm X. And then you reflect and say, hang on, this cannot be happening right at this point in time in a country like the U.S., uh, I'd like then to touch on a gentleman, a pastor, Clementa Clem Pinkley. Clementa, Pastor Pinkley, I touched on earlier and I said Barack Obama uh, gave a eulogy at his funeral. But he was an important player in Charleston. He ran Mother Emmanuel, the church, the AME church there. And, Bar and, and, and Bakari was with him at some stage talking to him about his running for lieutenant governor. And it's words that come from people like Clementa Pinkley, who are black, who talk to young black people. In other words, inspiring them and saying to him, I'm encouraging you, you must keep going, 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 you must fight on, don't give up. Those are the role models that I fight for in our country and in Africa as a whole. I always... I, 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 I attach myself to that. That's the first one. 
The second person who comes into this book is a gentleman by the name of Gerard Lodeholt. Gerard was very close to uh, Bakari. They went to school together. They moved to Morehouse together. They became roommates. When you read this book, you see this young man, Jared, supporting Bakari. When he went to elections, I will support you. I'll walk the path with you. When they worked, I'm sure you'll remember in the book, they worked at Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. They worked for one of the congressmen, Jim Cleburne who's still there, James Clevin, you see him on TV getting interviewed. They worked in his office as interns. That's where they plotted Bakari Sela's challenge on John Road uh, for the US state representative. This man has stood beside Bakari. And I'm saying, therefore, the second person, having spoken about Clementa Pinkley, I'm talking about uh, Jared Lodeholt, he has had good support system be, systems beyond his family and beyond the civil rights movement. Let me reflect on the other people who have supported him. Yes, we've got Jesse Jackson, we've got Julian Bond. I'm sure guys, if you read about Julian Bond, you'll be attracted to this type of person who unfortunately within the civil rights movement, him and John Lewis had a fallout when they're competing for the Senate position in uh, the, the Congress position in the in the U.S. Uh, uh, Congress, and John Lewis beat uh, Julian Bond, but they were part of the civil rights movement. The point I'm making is that I read this book and I felt that how can a country like the United States of America, that has spent its time in being the first world country, and still faces the racism that you read about? And you still read about the challenges that they still that they faced in 1968, in 1974, and you still face that today. Am I better off as South Africa? Have things changed for the better for my country? I think so. But we can, there are lessons that I believe maybe the US, and please, this is something that crossed my mind. The US may still need something like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission type of situation. Because if you read these things, there's a recent case that's not in the book of a young man, his name is McCain, who was murdered by the police. He was not okay, he was, not, he was ill, and the police killed him for no apparent reason. I'm sure we know that there are that the other cases where people are getting killed. Now, let me talk to you about an interesting chapter in the book. If you read this book from Bakari Sellers, all these chapters, he talks about him going to college, Morehouse, uh, becoming a, 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 a president of the SGA at school. Then he moves beyond that. He becomes a, a state representative in South Carolina. And then he moves there and he wants to challenge for lieutenant governor and he, he doesn't become successful. You think as you read the, this book, you're going to reach a stage where probably the chapters are focusing on him. He changes tech and he goes to a chapter in chapter 10 and he talks about the strength of women or the women who raised us. And that's a fascinating thing that why would all of a sudden this book change and this man talk about women? He's got great women that he's talking about in his life. The most important part I'm sure you know that chapter, why are the strongest women in the world dying? Why are the strongest women in the world dying? He's got a great mother. He's looked up to his mother. His mother supported him. Let me give you this picture. Bakari Selas runs into the kitchen. He finds his mom and dad sitting and he says, mom, dad, I'm going to run for state representative. What does his mother say? I'll vote for you. What does his father say? I'll think about it. That's where mothers play an important role. That's why in Setswana, those who speak Tswana who are privileged to be like me and speak the language, I would say, Mangwana Tswarati Bakahlawokhale. In other words, your mother is the one who will tackle, hold the knife on the sharpest side because they will defend you to the hilt. When your mother says that you are Bakari Selas, you are 20 years old, you're turning 21, you're going to run for state representative, and your mother says, I'll vote for you. Hell, it's like petrol, I'm telling you to a car because I'm going to run very fast. Rather than your mother saying, be careful, my son, you can't do this, you're still young or something like that. 
He then switches in this book, he goes to the chapter where he talks about why are the strongest women in the world dying? We're heading to the month of August, ladies and gentlemen. He talks about his aunt, great cook, great chef. Do you know that a woman like that in rural uh, America at the time who used to teach other women to be dietitians? That's amazing. That's a new trend with us today. That woman, that's his aunt. Then he talks about his mother. He talks about his wife, the strength his wife had when she gave birth to the, to, 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 to the, to, to the twins. Then he talks about quite a number of people, but there's a statement here, I'm sure you read it, and other people might find it offensive. It's a statement from Zora Neale Huston, the famous who described black women as the mules of the world. She described them as the mules of the world. And that's very important to talk about a subject about women, whereby you find that a man like Bakari Selas, instead of spending his time talking about himself, how he became the president at school, how he became a state representative of the age of 21, who, being surrounded by all these civil rights icons, he could have spent time on his ego. He could have arrogantly spent time on talking about himself, but he changes and then he talks about this important subject, which is very close to my heart. He says in this book, black women never had true allies. White women sacrificed and fought hard in the civil rights movement too, but they were just a handful. Black women have also fought against the oppression of black men. But where are the black men in the fight for black women? That's a very important statement to be made by this young man. Where are the black men in the fight for black women? After 50 some odd years, the country is finally to starting, to is starting to understand that African American women dictate the possibilities of who our elected officials are or who they can be. What we witnessed in 2016 is that more than 95% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton, who could have been the first female president, but 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump, someone who clearly does not, doesn't stand for women's rights. Let's leave the politics beside, aside. But the point I'm making is that, in summary, here's a young man who is surrounded by a world of possibilities, which it's a lesson for me, for my kids, for our kids, for us as South Africans. Two, our political system is different. I know that you probably work behind the party or you work for a party, then you become elected. If we were to be elected like the USA, I believe there are young people in South Africa who are the Bakari sellers of the future. Two, they may not have had the privilege of being, surrounded, of being surrounded by the civil rights movement icons that you are surrounded by. But the talent is there in South Africa. And Bakari Selas at the age of 21 to challenge for things like that, to say, I want to be a legislator, I want to go and fight hard to make sure that the world is a different place. He faced an interesting challenge at the end. He's still alive, he's strong. And as I said to you, my prediction is that probably beyond Joe Biden or Donald Trump, or beyond that, one day we will see that President Bakari Salats will show up one day somewhere. He talks about his daughter, Sadie. Sadie had a, a, a liver problem. And we know that she had to have a liver transplant at an early age. And he waited for 93 days to get a donor. And they were lucky that they had a donor. And we know that at the end, Bakari in the book thanks that family that donated the liver. And his daughter is strong. His son is strong, uh, Stokely. And Bakari Salas works today as a lawyer and he's at CNN, he's a commentator. And that's the book I wanted to talk to you about. Maybe I should stop there. Mr. Tenge, thank you so much. That was provocative inspiring and insightful. And we have a number of different questions. Um, one of the questions that um, I would like to pose is, how do we create more spaces 
for men to share, in inverted commas, their weaknesses and for them to use weakness as a way to learn and develop themselves. This is something that you touched on and I think there is much that we can explore in this idea and I wonder if you've got some more ideas for us. You know, when I grew up uh, as a kid in the township, I don't know for some reason why people wanted us to get involved in fights. I don't know why. And Professor Marwal, I'm sure you know in Venda, there's that thing, the fist fighting thing in December. You know it? Professor Marwala knows that. Uh, well, we call it uh, Musangwe. Yeah. So for some reason, we are told that we must fight. That's number one. We are warriors. Number two, if you read a book by the name of Sam Kin, Fire in the Belly, on becoming a man, Sam Kin talks about the issue of men. When you are a kid, you are told that as a little boy, why are you crying? Girls will laugh at you. Other kids will laugh at you. Don't do that. Don't cry. It's wrong. I don't think we should be doing that. It is important that we turn some of these things into strengths. I'll tell you an interesting story of somebody who's diabetic. He's a friend of mine. He told me a story that, Mike, what do I do? I'm diabetic and I don't want people, don't tell people that I've got sugar diabetes. Don't, don't, don't talk about that. And I said, we need to, to turn this into an opportunity. We need to write a book. You need to tell a story of being diabetic at an early age. And this friend of mine is now starting to come to terms with the fact that turn this so-called weakness into a strength. That's a lesson that we shouldn't forget. I think when I read this book, the whole, the whole story of anxiety, I thought it will come with something clinical, it will come with something medical. He opens up in the book, he talks, he talks about, I'm the youngest person who's taking this medication. I'm on prescription drugs. I know as a man, I know a lot of men, before they drink their medication, they'll go and hide themselves in the bathroom and sort of throw that tablet into their mouth. But do you know that they are on prescription? So for me, the message is to turn the negatives, to turn the things that we were told that they make us weak and make them our strength. The ability to cry. Bakari Salas cries. He has done it on TV several times. As I said to you, with the George Floyd situation, he was in tears. Whether people are saying he's pretending or not, but that shows you that you are a human being, you are real. Thank you. Then a student from UJ who is um, working in public health um, asks, I can say I identify with Bakari on many levels. What is the role and importance of exposure and mentorship in the grooming of young leaders? How can a young man such as myself be supported to be a future leader of Bakari's caliber? I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a missing thing in South Africa. We miss that opportunity. We miss that opportunity as South Africans uh, to mentor young people. I do it a lot. I've got a lot of people I mentor. I try to mentor them. Maybe there's, some of them have locked in here. They, they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell me that I'm lying. I, look, I try to mentor these young people. That's an opportunity for us. Those who are ahead of those who are behind us. Let's try and mentor these youngsters to be better men, to be better husbands, to be better citizens, to be better people. That's the most important part. When you read, uh, they talk about Morehouse, the school, that is the college in Atlanta. There's something about it. They call it the mystique of, Atlanta, of, of, of Morehouse. Mystique of, Atlanta, of, of Morehouse. I don't know whether you noticed that when they arrive at school, at Morehouse, when you arrive at college, your parents will walk with you towards the gate when you finished after the, the introduction. And when you arrive at the gate, your pal- parents don't look back. They look forward, they just go away and then leave you behind. Whether you're crying or what, and then the gate shuts behind your, back, behind your parents' back and they don't see you and then you disappear into that college. You know that there's this mystique about Martin Luther King, Samuel L. Jackson, Uh, Benjamin May, all those different characters who walked those corridors of of those institutions. We need to start telling these young people about the beautiful things that this country has done, the people we produced. My deep concern is that that void of mentoring and teaching young people 
we walk away from it. We need to teach men, Professor Marwala, Professor Sina, Professor Mike Deke, not Professor Mike Deke. We must start coming to the fore and mentoring these young people. Bakari Selas didn't go to these people. Do you know that in 2014, Julian Bond, a very strong man in the civil rights movement in the US, requested to interview Bakari, a young man who grew up under him. We must be able to create those platforms for these young people and say, we want to put you on the pedestal and make you better. Great, Mr. Teke. The last question was from a young man who comes from Springs. Um, so oh, I think there is, that he can resonate with you. The next group of questions are a number of questions around this very provocative idea of women as the mules of the world, and talking yeah. particularly of black women. Um, can you discuss in a little bit more detail both your own thinking and Bakari Sele's ideas of how black men could be liberating black women? Uh, the first thing that we were taught as kids, and I spoke about health, I spoke about crying. I grew up in corporate South Africa. And I still believe that men, I believe they still struggle having women as their bosses. I think so, especially black women. We need to come to terms with the fact that women are the same as men. Obviously, gender, I'm not talking biology, please don't misunderstand me that. And I'm not saying men must wear makeup and no, no, no. no. Number two, I run big mining companies. Years back, I grew up in this industry. When I grew up in the mining industry, we used to know that this place is not for sissies. That was a concept that we used to say. We used to say, this, this is not for sissies, this mining brother. You know, when you're in mining and you are a tough man, they call you, they, start, they see Easter, you're the tough one. Today, if you go underground in the mines, your mining engineer, your mining overseers, your mine captains, I told you must change that word probably, one, that name one day. All the ladies underground, they are the best who run underground sections today in the mines. They are tough. They don't take nonsense from anyone. And I have watched men who report to them. We must start from that point to say, these are normal people like us. They don't belong to the kitchen only. It's a lie. Three, there's an important part that I'm unfortunately I'm going to offend some of you men and women. When we grew up, there was something funny about us when we grew up, especially in townships. I didn't grow up in a suburb, I grew up in a township. There's this obsession of sleeping with women. We, we have that obsession that you sleep with 100 women or something, or being promiscuous or having two girlfriends or having a wife, and then you joke about things and saying, I've got a girlfriend somewhere. We need to come to terms with the fact that whilst you're doing that and you feel good in a shibin telling your friends about that story, it is not only offensive, but it destroys your own dignity. We need to start telling people about their own dignity, that a self-respecting man doesn't go around taking off his clothes in front of other women if he or she, if he has a family and a wife. We need to start telling kids that truth, that, 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 the truth about that. We don't talk about that. There are no lessons like that. At UJ, I don't think you have a lecture like that or somebody who's done a PhD talking. I know there was a master's degree thesis that was talking about, uh, what do they call these men? Bless us or something like that. We need to come to terms with the fact that men must wake up today and start believing that women are going to be part of this agenda. Which agenda? Growth, development, and the future. So the next question very related to this is, I identify with the anxiety that Mr. Teke raises relating to the support of women and in particular black women in business, politics, and society in general. I have been in I have been fortunate to enjoy your support in the boardroom, but your support is certainly not ubiquitous. And I think if we take this question about the um, role of supporting women in business and look at it in light of another question, which asks, what are we doing about this at UJ and in higher education? Um, perhaps you could elaborate on some ideas around that a little bit further. 
uh, still focusing on women, obviously. Yes, yeah. I must confess that Prof. Marwala will relate to this and the people who are on, I see Prof. Bega is there. You know, the fascinating thing is we made a conscious effort at UJ and I think everybody has bought into this agenda. If you have not, I think tonight you must stand in front of a mirror and think about it. We talk about transformation at UJ, not at UJ, countrywide. But the UJ agenda to get women into critical positions is evidenced by the numbers. That's number one. Our numbers in terms of attracting women into different spheres of our uh, uh, structure can, is clearly reflected and anybody who wants to question it can question it. But we're doing our best to push that agenda. But that agenda is not about numbers. It's wrong. We, we like to talk about numbers. We've got 48% here, 50% here. It's wrong. We need to start to say, is this environment, is the ambience, is the environment where we operate as a university accepting of the fact that we are all human, accepting of the fact that when a woman stands in front there speaking, it's a woman, it's a human being. This person can be your boss. This person can provide decisions. This person can provide leadership and guidance. As soon as we believe in that, I'm telling you, we are going to turn this world upside down. But it doesn't mean men are going to take second position or are going to be put on the back banner. In other words, we open the platform, we allow everybody to dance on the same dancing floor and we dance to the same tune and the same music. For me, Mr. Teke, one of the underlying themes of Bakari Seles' book is that of power and speaking out. Um, so I'd like to move our question and discussion a little bit away um, to now look a little bit more at what do you think we can learn from this book about standing up in an organization or a community or a country um, when we don't agree with what is happening and how people are being treated? Bakari, it's, it's an interesting thing that Bakari Selas talks about his father fetching him from school to go with him to, 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 to the memorial service to uh, uh, remembering 1968 Orangeback Massacre. It's a lesson for him. He sits there, he doesn't sit there as a passenger, he learns from that, he watches very closely. And it gives him the power to say, I'm going to turn this ugly thing that's been sitting on, my, uh, that's the way it's heavily on my dad or my father. And I'm going to turn it into an opportunity to make life different for humanity. The second one is, for him to challenge for state representative doesn't mean he wanted to do it at the age of 21 or it was glamorous and the like. This is the young man who saw that black people, African-Americans, we are behind. There's a big question in this book where they talk about why when other immigrants who come into the U.S., they become successful, very successful, but us as African-Americans, we don't become successful. It's a difficult, vexing question that he sits with and he says, we need to tackle these things directly. Number three, when Bakari Sellers starts to face people like Henry McMaster, we know there are stalwarts in, the, in, the, in, in, in politics, people who are entrenched, who are strong, who are going to... He starts to question those people. Number four, he didn't take easily when he was asked to... Uh, uh, support Barack Obama. He didn't. He didn't. When he received a phone call one day and uh, it was Barack Obama, he was going to class at law school. And Barack Obama said to him, will you endorse me for the president of the United States of America? Bakar Selas was thinking about it. And he said on two conditions, on condition that you come and visit my place at Denmark, at South Carolina. Number two, my mother becomes a volunteer. The point is, it's those opportunities that make people turn around and use that as power to benefit others. In other words, not power to be an egotist, but power to be an altruist. Mm -hmm. The power that I'm dreaming of in my life as Mike Tech, I want to make bucket loads of money to make a difference in other people's lives. That's, what, that's, that's why I relate to this young man's life and his memoir. 
So, Mr. Taker, the last question I want to ask before we run out of time really links to the very last thing you've just said. Bakari Sellers' story, and I think your own life story, is a story of rising up despite adversity. And for our young students listening to this, and um, perhaps all of us in general, what is some of the advice that you can give us when we try for something and at first we don't succeed, when the doors don't open and people don't hear what we're saying? Um, and how do we persist and continue and stay strong? Bakari could have walked away when he was told that he was a, uh, he was not a great basketball player. He is tall, he's very tall, and he believed that he could be a good basketball player, but his friends told him. He's got a friend, he grew up with a, a young man by the name of Pop, Jamal Williams. Jamal Williams sees Dr. Cleveland Sellers as his surrogate father. And Jamal uh, Pop, uh, Pop used to always say to Bakari, ah, you can't play, you can't play basketball. But he was tall, he thought he could play. Did it discourage him? No. When they tried to take away his presidency when he won at Morehouse, he fought hard. He fought for re-elections, for a runoff. Nothing discouraged him. He went back and he fought hard and he succeeded. When he had these anxiety, challenge, anxiety challenges, when he was standing in front of people, his chest, his chest would lock. He didn't know what to do. He thought he would have a health problem. He did not. He took it on and he challenged for that. When he lost the lieutenant governor, okay. as I said to you, there's a young man by the name of Mandela Barnes at Wisconsin. That young man is a lieutenant governor. Probably Bakari felt that at, an early, at a young age, I'll also be a lieutenant governor in South Carolina, and he lost. Mm. Has he walked away? No. It has made him more resilient, more tenacious, and willing to fight. But one thing that we must not forget as South Africans, and it happens with us, I see it all the time, we want success now. We want success now, and this success comes with pain. We need to make sure that we persist and fight hard. Mr. Teke, many, many thanks. Um, I have one question um, from Kinsa Berger. Should we consider inviting Bakari to present a public lecture at UJ, particularly yes. virtual yes. space? And um, I think uh, from reading the book, I personally would be incredibly excited by that idea. So I think yes. um, from our team in the library, we'll start to do some research and see if we can make something like that happen, because I think it will we be- We must do that, we must do that, we must do that. Yeah. Kinta, we must invite him, he must come and talk at the university. Yes, yes, that would be really exciting. Um, yeah. Mr. Teke, thank you so much. This has been- Can, I, can, I, can I read something? Can yeah. I read the last thing, you know? Please. A person by the name of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. Dr. Benjamin E. Mays was running Morehouse College for a long time. And uh, a person by the name of Elijah Cummings, who passed away, he was the congressman in the US. He, write, he wrote a poem and he read this, and I just want to close this with that poem. It says, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it. Give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to end with a lovely comment from um, Godfrey. Wow, thank you. This has been a life-changing moment, and I'm glad I managed to, to partake. And I think that sums up how we all feel. Mr. Taker, thank you for the inspiration, for the guidance. Thank you. Very much. Thank and, you. Uh, we look forward to another session with you sometime soon. Stay thank well. Thank you very much. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.